What's up, Sonico? Saludos, Luis. You have any hand pain because I'm a fan of you? You have any hand pain because of guitar? Yeah, I. Let's take this light out of here. Um, yeah, I do get hand pains every now and then. Depends on what I'm doing. Right now, I have a little bit of pain on this one. Um, mostly because I did a small workout about two days ago. I think I did a little bit too much. And especially, specifically, this type of pain I'm getting now is because of um, the elbow. But I already know that all I have to do is just um, get my hands in some ice. And in a couple days, it'll get better. So I don't really worry about it too much. Um, but yeah, I've had pain for... Yeah, since about, I've been, since about, I was about 17, I, I think. Um, but yeah, as long as you know what you're doing, it's also busy the doctor. Very important to get the right diagnosis and get everything um, in check. But yeah, uh, as long as you have everything in check, you're going to be fine. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm going to keep jamming. If you guys have any questions, just let me know. I'm just going to keep playing a little bit. Okay, so guys, whenever I get a Spanish question, I'll answer in Spanish. If I get an English question, I'll answer in English. Um, so I'm going to start off with Luis's question. Um, so, lo que tiende a recomendarse, además de pues, simplemente improvisar, tiende a recomendarse la cuestión de... Ah, eso, olvidé la palabra. Transcribir, o so, que buscar algún tipo de. Puedes buscar tu guitarrita favorita, buscar algunas frases que te gusten bastante, las sacas y las vas aplicando a, a la improvisación. Además de eso, pues aplicarla de distintas maneras. A mí me un poquito entonces por esa tangente, explicar, por ejemplo, si tenemos una frase, yo ahora mismo tengo aquí que estaba en do menor, vamos a decir que la frase hace esto. O sea, mover eso de cada, a través de los distintos acordes y a través de las distintas posiciones. Okay. El, el punto de esto es poder repetirlo en distintas posiciones. O sea, estamos aquí. En lo movemos todo, todo una nota hacia arriba. Entonces, eso suena como una frase que como una pregunta, así que podemos hacer unas cuantas, seguir subiendo, subiendo y culminar respondiendo esa pregunta. Entonces, 
Eso podría ser algún tipo de ejercicio que puede hacer y lo puede hacer con cualquier tipo de frase que, que haya aprendido. Eh, hello, Raymond. Um, shout out from Puerto Rico. I hope everything is going um, okay over there. Thanks for all the craziness that's going on in the world right now. Um, I use a um, Jazz 3. I like a couple of their picks, but they're a little bit harder to get, so this is the, the simplest type of pick to find. Um, it's cheap and it, it works for me. Um, if I could, I would use some other different picks, but for now, this is what I'm using. I use this one for about pretty much most of the years I've been playing since I was about 17. Um, okay, what other scales can you suggest to spice up a simple rock ballad track? Except from pentatonic and diatonic scales. Okay, so that's gonna depend on the type of track. It's gonna also gonna depend on the type of chords. That you're that you're playing. Um, and excuse me, I'm getting messages from work already, um, so I gotta check that out. Um, but yeah, um, it's gonna depend on the type of track. If it's just purely minor, like now with this four different chords, the way you can look at it is as if it's you could take any chord within that and treat it as as its own thing. That's more of a modal type of approach into adding different scales and other things. So let's just say we're here. It's a C minor. If it's just a straight up C minor type of thing, you just play C minor. You could play pentatonic as you say also. If it's depending on the type of function that chord's doing, um, you could use different modes, for example, you could go frigid, or you could do like a word. Um, but you could also add different phrases with melodic minor or harmonic minor. That's harmonic, this is a melodic. Um, so you could take a little bit borrowed from that and then you could also just add in different um, things like a really good and simple type of concept is different approaches so sometimes what I do is I just look at the arpeggio so I add the ninth there um, something like that and then just add um, the chromatic approach notes that are behind each of those notes. So if it's C, you just play B for it. Then if you have G, you play F sharp. And then for the E flat, you play D. So. And then that way, I'm just adding a little bit of chromaticism um, to, to the playing without going as far as adding different scales. Another cool thing you could do closely related to that is just filling the different holes of the minor scale. And this is something I did in, I think it's the last video, if it's not the last video, I think the last lesson. So I think the last video I posted was um, the Rav demo. Um, but what you could do is just fill in those different notes. And you can do that throughout the whole scale. So I'm just adding random chromatic notes. In this case, I'm at always adding the, the notes that go to the right. So let me show it, show it a little bit clearer than that. So just so that's these two notes are the limits of the minor scale. So I'm just gonna fill um, all those notes that are getting between that. Same thing for the next position. Go down to the next position, do the same thing. And then when I go down to the next position after that, it's like something like this if I do a middle for string. So I'll just add this note right in the middle. So whenever I have a gap of a fret in between my index finger and my middle finger, I'll just fill in the rest of the gaps with this finger right here. So. That's pretty much it.
It's a pretty cool trick that you can add. Um, different sounds. It's not really a specific scale, but you could do that. You can also add the third mode of the Messian mode of the Messian, uh, the third mode of transposition, um, of Oliver Messian's um, different transposition modes, or whatever. Um, and that's gonna be something like this, or something from here. And then just finish off the phrase somewhere else, or something like that. You can do, I'm gonna go into a C minor arpeggio. Do that, add those last four notes with the chromatic thing I just explained. Go down to this position. And then from there, just this B note is insinuating something like harmonic minor or melodic minor. And then from there, I can just do um, the, the Oliver Messiaen melody. So, and just resolve on any note within the, the minor scale. So that's another cool thing that you could do. Uh, Sonico, ¿cómo hace el fraseo outside? Ya sea para la función progresivo. Pues bastante de lo que acabo de decir, acabo de explicar, eh, le aplica. O sea que no sé si, si habla inglés, pero pues déjame saber si, si entendiste todo lo que acabo de, de explicar, porque todo lo que acabo de mencionar le aplica a ese tipo de, de comentarios. Um, lo otro es seguir lo, los changes, como quien dice, de la canción. Entonces si tienen algún tipo de acorde dominante, usar el alter, usar este, la full diminished, usar el... Eh, Holton, cualquier tipo de escala que quede un poquito fuera. Lo mismo puede hacer con alguna escala bastante parecida a la escala principal que esté utilizando, es simplemente cambiar una que otra nota o cambiar a una escala que tenga la mayoría de las notas adentro y una que otra nota que caiga afuera. Por ejemplo, bien, de nuevo con la escala menor. Las notas son 1, 2, bemol 3, 4, 5, bemol 6, bemol 7 y pues caemos de nuevo a la octava. Eso que lo que puede hacer es intercambiar cualquiera de esas notas Um, y utilizar una escala parecida. El único problema que tenemos es que vamos a tener más avoids porque son notas que están completamente fuera. Así que tienen que evitar quedar, caer en esa nota para resolver el acorde. Porque si no, por ejemplo, si utilizamos melodic minor en vez de la escala menor, tendríamos una sexta natural y una séptima natural que no caen dentro de la escala menor de manera pues, normal. Y si resolvemos la frase, por ejemplo, en una séptima, va a sonar un poco extraño porque vamos a tener esto ocurriendo entre el acorde y la nota que estás tocando. Déjame ver si tenemos demasiada distorsión. Entonces estoy tocando normal y resuelvo. Eso, como que no suena para nada emocionante, no suena increíble. Eh, así que recomiendo que estén bien atentos a en dónde resuelven las frases. Vas, ¿qué está pasando? Saludos, todo bien acá, mano. What's up, Shi uh, Faisal? She was from Puerto Rico. Um, remember, you guys, if you have any questions at all, just jot them down at the chat. I'll keep answering them. If not, I'll keep playing or just talking about random stuff. Um, so usually a lot of people like to ask either improvisation, like going outside a little bit, so I can keep talking about that a little bit. Um, guys also tend to ask a little bit about legato, so I can also talk about that a little bit. Um, so I don't know, just let me know what interests you, and I'll do my best to talk about it. So for now, I was talking a little bit about going outside, which was the last question. So there's a whole bunch of different ways of doing this. Um, I think conceptually the easiest way, um, well not the easiest way of doing it, but one of the easiest way of, ways of looking at it is to grab the actual scale that you can play over um, whatever chord and then just modify it by one or two notes. You do that by playing a scale that's very similar to that. Let me grab my board. Hey, I got sleeping on top of my board like it. Let <laughs> me grab that board. Let me see if I have another one around here. Oh, she's sleeping on top um, of both of my whiteboards, so I can't really eat that, I guess. Um, anyways, 
but if you have, for example, Dorian, which is one, two, five, three, four, five, six, um, and flat seven, then you can play a little bit of melodic minor, which is pretty much the same thing. The only difference is the seventh degree of the scale, which is a, a natural seven, um, and then you have the same six, the same five, the same four, the same flat three, the same two, same everything else. Um, so you could technically go into that a little bit more. Um, how to understand Alan Holdsworthian scales. Um, so there's this really good um, video, instructional video that um, Mr. Holdsworth did um, himself. And he actually talks about the 10 scales he likes to do the most. I've actually got um, a, a lesson based on that. Not yet, it, it's scheduled. Um, so I got a... Yeah, I gotta sit down and plan out that, that lesson. But the way to understand them is, is just to study each of those scales. Now, probably something that's a little bit more important than knowing the scales is probably learning how to phrase like him. Because pretty much everybody plays the major scale and the minor scale in the modes, and a lot of jazz guys do melodic minor, a lot of guys like in metal play harmonic minor. There's all tons of different modes within that. Um, so pretty much the most important thing to learn is how to phrase a little bit more like him if you want to sound like him. Um, and that's going to be a little bit more than, than really just going, than really just playing the scale. Because me just going, let's say if I want to play water minor, I'm just going, dude, that doesn't sound at all like Alan Holdsworth. Um, so it's just going to depend on how he phrases it. And then the other thing is, kind of a shortcut, is learning that third Messian mode. So, yeah, you can play that and then learn some of the slicks. I think the most important thing to learn how to play like anybody, um, if that actually interests you, um, is to figure out some of their moves and then apply them. Um, that's pretty much what I do with all my videos. I sit down. I study a lot of material, I listen to their music a lot, and then I just make a mini intro performance trying to sound like them. Obviously, it's not going to sound exactly like them because I don't have all the specific articulations and phrasing down, but you could totally learn all those um, as well. And then I don't recommend it because I don't like, um, like completely copying someone's style, but yeah, just grabbing little bits and pieces here and there, it's always good. Let me keep up with the messages because I'm falling a little bit behind. Um, hey man, do you ever listen to the No Guitar Safe podcast? Um, I should. Um, I I've heard of it. I think I've probably um, heard one episode or something. It sounds very familiar. I haven't checked it out completely, so I have to do that. Um, I'll keep the video running after I finish this just so I can check the name back. Leo Marik, saludo, este Leo, creo que te escribí esta mañana, eh, para cuando sale en, en español el libro, tengo que trabajarlo, tengo que trabajarlo, ahora mismo, esta misma semana se me ha hecho hasta difícil hasta tirar la lección de la semana, que ya está planeada, ya están todos los tabs, está el backing track, está grabado el performance, está grabado los ejemplos, me falta grabar la parte de la lección como tal, porque con todo este revolú del COVID-19 y qué sé yo, eh, movieron todo el todo mi trabajo a la manera web y todavía estoy adaptándome y además de eso estoy escribiendo a la persona llamando a personas todo el tiempo es un pequeño revolú a la que salga de eso pues puedo trabajarlo si no estuviese trabajando con eso pues me hubiese dado mucho más tiempo para trabajar en eso así que hasta ahora está en veremos pero realmente no falta tanto por por traducir ya yo hice bastante del trabajo es cuestión de sentarme y terminarlo realmente así que espero poder terminarlo pronto eh, más, si estoy en un improv, en un simple 251 en, en D minor, ¿qué modo puedo utilizar para darle un flavor diferente? Ok, eh, si es en menor, lo acuerden para que eh, D minor 7 flat 5, A7, desde D minor 7. Para D minor 7 flat 5, podría tocar lo que es natural 2 que es lo mismo que decir melodic minor, eso va a sonar un poco así. Y para el 
nada. Vamos a ver Alter, que es bastante normal. Ay, tengo algo en el bajo. Terminamos el primero, que podemos hacerlo menor. O podemos hacerlo eh, melodic minor, harmonic minor de nuevo. No son las opciones más seguras, pero, pero tienen una pequeña opción ahí. <ríe> no con el ojo, no lo puedo sacar. Um, y, y le va, va a dar un sonido un poco distinto. Eso funcionaría como se escucha algo así. Um, so prácticamente tenemos el, el tube. O sea, también pueden cambiar distintas escalas, podrían ser Holton por un segundo. Empezar en Alter y cuando llegue a la tercera y segunda cuerda voy a cambiar a Holton. So. Y resolverá a cualquier tipo de escala menor. Ahí lo que hice fue insinuar un poquito Harmonic Minor y después seguir haciendo lo que mencioné ahorita de los de los approaches y ahí tienen varias cosas eh, saludos Pablo eh, what's up Dickin hi what is your method to visualize the fretboard okay so I have a few different ways um, of looking at the fretboard first thing is you can all know the notes that's a given light here is kind of like busting everything up um so the first thing is you gotta know the notes that's that's a given you gotta know the notes um for any type of um fretboard visualization visualization type of of deal now i have it broken down into different approaches i like all different approaches and my philosophy is the more that you can know the better So I don't believe in the whole three note per string versus case versus all that stuff. Learn it all and then just apply it in different ways. So the way I do it, I look a lot of the stuff is very three note per string based. Um, but then in terms of breaking it down and looking into different octaves, it's very much similar to caged. Now within those different patterns, I tend to look at everything um, by intervals. So the thing is, you can look at it as almost as if, okay, you got a pentatonic scale here. This is a C minor pentatonic. Then you can have any of the additions to that. So you can add the second, the, the fourth, yeah, the fourth all the the sixth, flat seven, flat six, two, flat three, four. I mean, five, flat six, six, flat seven. So I just look at the specific, the normal patterns that everyone looks at. Um, but then I look at the function of each of those notes. That way I can modify the scales on the fly and I don't have to um, depend on specific patterns. The other cool thing about looking at it in this fashion is that you don't necessarily have to study a specific scale pattern to be able to play a new scale. So I'm someone just gives me the formula or a new scale, I don't need guitar diagrams to figure out the scale. So let's make something up right now. Let's say we have new scale and the scale is like one flat, two, three, five, six, flat seven, seven, and that's it. So I think I said one flat, two, three, five, I don't know if I said six or flat six, anyways, six, flat seven, seven, one. So that's the scale. That's the scale right there. I didn't have to look that up from anywhere online. And I can just apply those same notes all across the, the fretboard. Um, yeah, so, well, this is kind of cool because you have a whole bunch of different chromatic. Have all those 
those five open chromatic notes within that same scale. I just made it up. Oh, we have this one. Wow, that's a lot of chromaticism within just one scale. But it sounds cool. I mean, whatever. Um, that's not the whole. That's not the important part, anyways. Um, so yeah, figure out three note per string. Um, three note per string. I also like to look at um, what do you call it? Mini patterns. So you could go like this. Yeah, right there. And and then just look at that same mini pattern everywhere else. And then here. Uh, and just keeps moving around everywhere. Um, share sequences, sequence scales for fusion rock. Okay, so what I think is probably the most. Oh, I'll look at the next sequence scales for fusion. Okay, so probably the most used fusion, you could say, fusion scale out there. It's probably melodic minor, I would say. Um, and you could adapt that to pretty much any chord because of the different modes. So you could play melodic minor for any minor situation or minor major seven chord. So you could play um, Dorian flat two over a minor um, you know, minor chord. You could play um, Lady on Augmented over a major chord um, or a commanded chord. So you could play Lady Dominant over a dominant chord. You could play um, Mixolydian flat six over a dominant chord. You could play Locrian natural two over a minor seven flat five type of chord. And then finally have Altered or those resolving dominant types of chords. Um, so really, you could play melodic minor anywhere. Um, I believe that's what I did for the last 251. And that's a great segue because the next question is <laughs> it's about the 251 in, in D minor. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll totally explain it in, in English now, Bent. Um, so yeah, we have, I'd say we have Again, a, a D two five one, a minor two five one, and D minor. So D minor seven five five, A seven, and then D minor. What I did is I substituted, or I just played um, different scales over each of those chords. So instead of just playing D minor over everything, I spiced that up a little bit by playing some other modes. So D minor seven, you could just play D minor over that. It's the same as Locrian. Gonna sound good. But you could also play Locrian Natural 2, which is the same as saying G melodic minor. It's gonna sound like this. Then we have um, A7. Then you could play A altered, which is the same as B flat melodic minor. Oh, sorry. And then for D minor, you could play D minor, or you could play D melodic minor, um, or harmonic minor. Um, you could even go a little bit further and play melodic minor sharp 11, which is the fourth mode of harmonic major. And it's going to give it this type of sound. Which is really cool. I like to add that sharp 11 in there. In minor situations just to mess around. So this right here, this is actually not even... That would be... That would be a lot of minor sharp 11. Sorry about that. This would be... Um, just like a minor thing. Uh, I'm in D again. So I'm just adding the sharp 11. This is the third. This is the natural seventh. And this would be the flat six. So it's almost as if it's like harmonic minor, but then added sharp 11. And the cool thing about that is that you can go real easily into the Oliver Messiaen mode. Again, it's the same thing I mentioned before, and I'll go some. <laughs> Now the thing about that is you gotta learn when to get out of that scale. You can go into it a little bit and then come back just so it doesn't sound all crazy all the time. Uh, what fingerings are you using? For for what? 
while running to the scale. What figure are you using? Okay. Oh wait, you said you got it. Okay. Um. Okay. Hopefully you got it. Let me know if, if you want me to go back to that question. Hey man, I love your videos. They really help. Thanks, man. I'm glad they're helping. Um, uh, from injury. What's up, Chief? Saludos, estudiantes de América. Saludos, amiga, Master Panda. What's the best way to learn the melodic minor mode? It's a bit confusing. Okay, so it's pretty much the same thing as the modes in the major scale. So just learn. I would say if you haven't done melodic minor, just just learn melodic minor at first. Just go over the different patterns, all that stuff. Just learn, just learn the scale all over the neck. Um, then there's different ways of, of learning those or applying this um, to the different um, modes. You can learn each of the different modes as a scale diagram. I don't love doing that. You can learn them just based on the formulas and looking at the different intervals and the different positions. Um, and you can also learn them by associating it, associating it with the parent scale. Now what I mean by that is that you're literally just going exactly what I did with the 251. Um, you could just go, okay, I have a minor, that's not do minor, I have a dominant chord and I want to play Lydian and dominant. So just go up a fifth and play the melodic minor scale from there. Um, I have a bunch of videos on the some of the different modes of melodic minor. I can't really tell you right now which ones I already did, um, but I know I have altered, I think I already have melodic minor, I have an older one talking about Lydian dominant. Um, I'm not sure if Loki Natural 2, I think I did Mixolydian Flat 6. Pretty much each one of them is out there except probably Lydian Augmented. Um, so you can check those out and I explain it a little bit more in depth. So I would say learn the formula, um, learn the melodic minor um, thing first, and learn the formula for each, the formula and the name for your, each of the modes. That's going to be very important because that's going to tell you over which chords you can actually play that over. Um, and then learn the hack, learn the hack to think about it as the parent scale. Um, so if you want to write those down really quickly right now, you can do it. A melodic minor is just from the root, um, and it's played over a minor chord or a minor major seven chord. Um, Dorian flat two or flat nine, however you want to look at it. Um, you just go down a whole step from the chord and play melodic minor from there. So if the chord is D minor, you would play C melodic minor. <laughs> Um, if, and then that would go over a minor chord, yeah. Um, then we have Lydian Augmented. I'm going to go down to C to e do each one of these. Now Lydian Augmented would play over a major 7 sharp 5 chord. But you could also kind of play it over just a major chord. It's going to sound very out, so you got to be very careful for your resolve. But it's going to spice things up a little bit. But again, you have C, then you augmented, and you're going to go up a sixth, and you're going to play a lot of minor from there. So in this case, okay, I'll, let me know when you're ready, and I'll keep I'm talking about it. Um, so for, okay, so maybe I'm going to, I'm going to keep talking. If there's one that you don't have written down, just let me know, and I'll, I'll let you know what it is. <laughs> um, so yeah, Lydian Augmented is the third mode, and again, it's played over major um, seven sharp five, seven chord or an augmented chord, and from here you just go up a sixth. So a sixth from C would be A, and from A you're gonna play a melodic minor. So it's pretty much a melodic minor over that C. Okay, good. So, again, over a C major 7 sharp 5 type of chord, you would play A melodic minor. And that's going to work. Now, the next one would be Lydian dominant, which is the fourth mode. 
Um, I like the over a dominant chord. In this case, I'm playing a dominant seven sharp eleven chord. And from here, you go up a four. So if I'm in C, you would go over to F and play the. Oh wait, I'm talking about Libyan dominant, right? Yeah. For a second, I kind of thought I was talking about Italian flat six. Um, okay, Libyan dominant, you would go up a fifth. And from there, you would play, um, again, melodic minor, so... And that's, that's scale right there, so that's Lydian dominant of a fifth. Um, next one would be Mixolydian flat six. That would go over a dominant chord again. This one I'm doing... Um, this one I'm doing um, dominant chord with a flat 13. Now from here you could go up a four. Now you would play F melodic minor over that. So that would go sort of like this. That's a pretty cool, interesting sound. Um, after that, we have um, Lofi Natural 2. And then from there, we have a minor 7 flat 5 type of chord. And you go up a minor 3rd, which from here would be E flat, and then just play water minor from there. And then finally, we have this normal alto chord, which would be anything like a flat 9, sharp 9, a flat 5, or a sharp 5, a dominant chord with any of those. Um, altered extensions, and usually you would play this chord, you would play this scale over a chord that's um, dissolving. It doesn't matter if it's dissolving down to minor or major, um, it's going to work as long as it's creating that tension. And you can play um, melodic minor of a half step, so we're in C. You would play D flat, D flat melodic minor over that C. And that's all seven modes of melodic minor. If there's any one that you didn't get that you couldn't write down, let me know and I'll repeat it. Um, that's pretty much it. Let me see what else. Um, any C minor skill licks? Mega Master Panda. Um, okay, C minor skill licks. Simple one. Let me see. I'm just gonna do one of my favorite moves. Uh, actually, no. I'm gonna do one that I've been practicing, so I don't really have it too down, but it's there. And that's the lick. So it's using hybrid picking. It's using a little bit of legato, and it's pretty much a C minor arpeggio. At least I look at it as C minor arpeggio. Then I add the fourth and the second. Um, I will be doing a lesson on a move sort of similar to that, hopefully in about a month when I can actually play that. And it sounds good and clean and, and all that good stuff, um, but it's not ready yet, so I still got some practicing to do. Um, where did I learn all my theory? Um, I studied at Musicians Institute. Um, and I got a lot of it from just the normal harmony and theory classes, but then I studied a lot of stuff on my own. And then I had a really good teacher also at school um, called Alex Matichek. Um, So I learned a lot from him also. But then just, I kept studying after that, um, learned a whole bunch of other stuff just on my own, through books, through different schools. Actually, I'm a professor now over a school here at Berkeley International School. That's called Conservatorio de Testa y Caribe. And I actually learned a couple things there as well before I actually um, was called to work there. Uh, and... I guess that's pretty much it. Just learned all over the place, just from studying, really. Um, yeah, yeah, mostly school, and yeah, I, I 
mostly school and like studying on my own, just figuring stuff out. Um, I do like the theory quite a lot, so I do sit down, or I used to sit down more. I um, hardly have a lot of time anymore since I'm working a lot. Um, but yeah, I did. I do love, and you can ask my students. I love just sitting down with a with a whiteboard and jotting stuff down and seeing what comes up. Uh, any music learning secrets you got? Um, practice, <laughs> practice, and try to understand what you're doing. Um, if you're, yeah, just try to learn. Try to understand what you're doing. Don't just learn licks. Um, which learning licks is really good, um, but try to understand why those licks work. And try to understand how you can move those licks around and not just play the same thing over and over again. Um, sort of like what I did before, where you just grab. <laughs> Does that work um, over a different chords? I'm oh, sorry. You keep going over all that stuff. Um, but yeah, don't just learn the likes, but learn how they work. Let me see what else we got here. I missed the first and second melodic minor modes. Okay, yeah, sure. So melodic minor is, I think I didn't go through the actual formulas, but you could check those out online. I don't want to take too long talking about that. Um, so melodic minor, you can just play over a minor chord. You could kind of toss it in there over a minor chord progression, but careful with that seventh. Um, and pretty much over a minor major type of chord, because it, it is a minor major scale. It's past minor third and a major seventh. So you gotta be careful with that. And then the next one, and the trick for that, there's really no trick because it's it's the root. So just play it from the root. Um, and then the other one that you missed is Dorian flat two. And for Dorian flat two, you would play it over a minor chord. You gotta be a little bit careful because that flat nine is or that flat two is gonna cause a little bit of tension. Um, but as with the other stuff, just don't resolve your lines there. Go to something else. That'll work. Um, and the trick for that is just go down a whole step um, and just from there just play the chord, the scale. So again, we're in D minor, you just go down to C and play the C melodic minor, yeah, C melodic minor scale. Um, but I don't recommend always going and starting from the actual root of the melodic minor scale. I recommend if you're just practicing the scale, practice it from the root of the chord. So, that's going to sound more like the actual scale that you're playing. That's pretty much the two ones, uh, the two scales that you did in C. Um, rig. Well, right now I'm plugged in directly into my Boss Katana part of the series. Um, and just using the, the distortion, the, yeah, the ground amp type. Yeah, I've got the gain very high. <laughs> so yeah, the, the gain is pretty much all the way up. And then I don't boost it, not in my apartment, because um, I get a lot of ground. Just this density here is not that great. And so, yeah, if I boost it, the ground just goes nuts. So I prefer just adding all the gain instead of boosting it. But if I had a choice, I would rather boost it. Um, and then if it's just on the computer, I just, like every, all the lessons I do, I record directly into my interface, directly into the, into the kitty, no, directly into the interface, and then I use the, the Logic plugin, so really it's nothing special, it's very simple, um, just open up a session, open up, I usually just do the, the standard amp they throw at you at the beginning, um, so it has all the settings that they provide, and then I just change it up from there. Um, I usually use, uh, I think it's Stadium something, Stadium League or Stadium, I don't know. And then I put a, like a rat in front of it, um, the rat pedal, which is all the distortion pedals they, they allow you to use, um, or they provide, I'm sorry. 
So it's not an actual rad pedal. I actually have one here, but that's not. <laughs> it's not. I'm not pushing it with that. I'm doing everything within the actual software. Um, and then just add delay and reverb and your standard sound from there. Uh, go back. Press if I've been playing for years, and I'm just starting to learn to know what a difference in my playing. Yeah, man. A lot of people. I don't know why, but they tend to bash theory, thinking that it'll, it'll take away your soul or something. Um, there's just way, like, if we were to look at it in a scientific fashion, look at all those insane players with a theory background, and do they sound like they don't, like, I don't know, too much technique or something? I don't think so. <laughs> There's just way too many really good players that sound soulful. I mean, the soul, or just it's just musicality. I mean, look at the Mateo Sassato. Like he's the the poster boy for a beautiful playing now, yeah. or at least one of the poster boys. The guy knows his theory, so there's definitely no correlation between not knowing what you're doing and sounding good. So yeah, theory does help quite a lot. Let me see what else. Recommend those in my books. I already have the Harmony and Theory, for Tone Soloing, and other one for solos. What other ones should I study? In terms of in terms of theory, I think the most important thing is learning how the modes work and learning learning the formulas really well. Learning how you get chords from those scales um, and how it's how it's all pretty much the same thing. Um, once you get that concept down, you learn how different intervals work really well, then I would, it's almost like, it's almost like you have to sit down and figure out all the other stuff on your own at, to a certain point. Not really, but to a certain point, because a lot of it is just figuring different stuff out, especially for different genres and for different um, players. Like, if you want to know what, I don't know, Steve Vai is doing, then just learn some of his moves, your favorite Steve Vai moves, and then analyze them. Why do these notes work? Over what chords is he playing him over? Um, so just analyze everything, and then that way you really learn. So there's probably a ton of books out there that really work. Um, I haven't studied from books in a while now. The last thing I studied was... Probably a Tim Miller make good riff book. That was a while. That was about two years ago already. This time just flies by. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's all kinds of really good theory and harmony and all kinds of things um, out there. But most of the stuff I learned was either through classes or just me sitting down and figuring stuff out. Just figuring out the different functions of different legs and different notes against different chords. And, just a lot of experimenting as well. For example, I figured out two different applications, one for the whole tone scale and one for um, harmonic major. It just sort of it didn't come out of the blue, but I got an idea like, okay, so you could move certain scales up and down a half step and apply them in a different fashion than what they're usually applied. Um, what they're usually applied. Um, and you can figure out different things just by doing that. Like with the whole tone scale, you always look at it from the root. I just say, what if I begin from the other step, then analyze it from there? And I figured out that you have pretty much a melodic minor scale, but instead of the of the having the root, you have no root, and that root is changed for a flat nine. Um, sounds kind of weird, and it gives you it gives you a bit of a spacey, vague feeling of what whole tone usually does, um, but then you can apply it over a minor chord. It sounds really weird, so you got to be very careful with it. And then the same thing with um, harmonic major. I just thought about what if I use it, um, I guess it's the relative major, to a minor chord. So if we have a minor chord, I can play C harmonic major. It has no root. But it's pretty much the same thing. And we have flat seven and seven, but no root. So that, again, that's a pretty trippy application of something 
And I didn't learn that from any book. It was just me just sitting down and just experimenting, really, I guess. Any thoughts on a way other than chromatic exercise to dial in your alternate picking? Um, pick everything. Make any, like, create your own picking exercises. Um, this just feel like really bright all of a sudden. I think I, oh yeah, yeah there it is. Okay. So you can, I mean, I'm not a great alternate picker. That's definitely not my thing. Um, that's, that's, you can always get that normal Paul Gilbert, um, exercise down. But just practice everything with alternate picking if you really want to get good at it. So if you want to practice thirds, pick pick them, pick everything. If you want to do fifths, same thing, pick everything. If you want to do, if you want to do work, like arpeggios, treating them as if they're thirds, and alternate, pick that. The important thing is to grab a few moves and get them down really, really well. That's what I did with at least most of my legato stuff. I just have like five or six moves down kind of kind of well. And then I just switch in between those different moves. I keep adding stuff all the time, but but yeah, I just switch between those so you can pretty much do the same thing with alternate picking. Okay, so sure thing there. Uh, one move to Puerto Rico that you teach me. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm probably going to be moving from Puerto Rico. Well, not soon, because we got all this uh, virus outbreak. But, <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'm planning on moving in about a year, depending on what happens. Um, yeah, so not, everything's not totally decided, but if not, then totally, just let me know. Let's see what else? Can you make a video on how to play like June Cinema, Fresh 40? One of my favorite guitarists, but I don't find any review. <laughs> Never heard of him, so again, I'll I'll leave the video up so I can look at the comments. Although actually, I don't know if the comments stay, so I'm just gonna screenshot this. Uh, I'm just gonna take a quick screenshot. And uh, yeah, it works. So I'll check it out. And then see what Hola Juan, saludos de España, diferencia entre Juan de Acorde y Pares de Triada. Eh, lo único que se me ocurre realmente en cuanto a diferencia entre Juan de Acorde y Pares de Triada, lo único que se me ocurre, también, prácticamente lo mismo, es que pero uno lo toca armónicamente, o sea, toca los dos, las dos triadas a la vez. Um, y lo otro son, pues, simplemente te lo puedes tocar armónico. Pero, bueno, no sé, eso es, a cierto punto eso es. Entonces, poliacordes, tendrías que verificar que no sea algún tipo de acorde que, que no haya que escribirlo con un poliacorde. Eh, pares de triada también se pueden ver muchas veces como, como escala hexatónica. A mí no me encanta verlo de esa manera, pero si sí, hay un montón de personas que lo ven de esa manera um, y dependiendo de cómo o sea hay distintas maneras de aplicarlo so que no sé buscando diferencia entre ellas realmente no veo tanta diferencia el análisis sería el mismo para ambos sería sentarse a escoger cuál va a ser tu base y estudiar la función de todas esas otras notas en comparación a esa, a esa raíz um, y después luego de eso lo aplicas como quieras, ya sea melodía, ya que sea improvisación, ya sea composición. Um, eso sería prácticamente todo lo que se me ocurre. Eh, no te vayas. Eh, deja ver qué, qué pasa. Pero sí, hay un chance bien grande de que dentro de un. aproximadamente dentro de un año me vaya de aquí. Deja ver, deja ver qué, cómo se mueven las cosas. Entonces, creo que ya tengo... Oh, wait, wait, wait. An important question. Is that a cat sleeping? Yep. The cat sleeping. <laughs> this sort of freaked out there for a second. Yeah, that's totally a cat sleeping. Um, so, yeah, what else? Eh, gracias, Juan. Sigue así. Seguro, seguro. 
Let's see if I can read what I can find around here. And dirty blue frog. Yeah, play this. Let me see if it's this. This the cat cat playing. Whoa. This the cat play guitar. Well, she plays with my plays with my guitar. I don't know if she plays actual guitar. But probably, yeah. I mean, probably. I mean, let me see if I can grab her. Let me show you guys. I can't see. It's a little uncomfortable. This is the first time I I show her on camera. But this is kind of cool. Come on. There she is. <laughs> she doesn't look too happy, but there she is. I gave her a bath a couple of days ago, and she smells like shampoo. She smells real nice. It's a good kitty. <laughs> Let's see what else we got here. Oh, uh, folks, you must say bye. Oh, hola. <laughs> so cute. Yeah. There she is, Kitty. Do you play with alternate tuning sometimes, and do you write original music? Um, I don't really play a lot with alternate... Whoa! I guess you got sick of that. <laughs> um, I don't really play around with alternate tunings too much. Um, and I do write my original music. I'm actually working on an album right now. And I've been writing the music for a while. Um, I'm still getting down the... Oh, she tried to see a picture of face. Sure did. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm totally writing music right now. I have about six songs. I have a couple more, but those are the main ones I'm working on. Just so I can try to get that EP out um, soon. But with work... And with earthquakes and coronavirus and all, all the good stuff that we've got in here um, for 2020, it's getting a little overwhelming. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's see if I can get a little bit more time working on that. Right after I finish the live, I gotta make a few phone calls for work. I gotta turn in some papers and I gotta finish recording um, the next lesson which hopefully goes up tomorrow if I don't get any more inconveniences then once I'm done with all that I'll try to sit down today and maybe do like some drum parts or something for one of the songs uh, let's see what else we got here can you show some of your hybrid picking techniques on arpeggios and scales okay so for <coughs> For arpeggios, there's the one I always... Well, no, I'm going to explain a new one I'm working on. I still haven't gotten it down. Um, this one is something close to... Um, it's not really close to what Andrew does, but it's very much influenced. Um, and it's just... I'm going to do it from C major. It's just a C major arpeggio adding a ninth. So... <laughs> And then from there, I'm trying to add a couple more moves, so not just that. So then I also do this, and then also a five-string version. And to that, I like to add different um like substitutions or changes. Just for example, if we have. C major, I can play C major. Okay. So. Or, like this. As you can tell, I, I don't have it down all that well. And then you can just kind of start building and developing from that. So, from there, I'm doing heavy picking in the first. Yeah, so. So pick, hammer on, finger, finger, and then pick, and then I just sweep 
down. Oh, oh wait, I forgot now. That camera on the third string as well. Then you can do that to the next one. Or then move to the next one. I like F, even though F is an avoid because it's almost as if you're playing A minor. So. Something like that. I actually gotta work on it quite a bit. Um, it's still not there um, all the way, but that's the latest thing I've been working on that includes a little bit of higher picking. Now in terms of the actual scales, this is pretty much what I always say. Figure out some specific moves that you like and then just apply them all the way. So again, let's do C major. What I do is you can totally play this with just a But I'd rather use my middle finger, which is the finger I use the most. So pick, finger, and pull off. And pick and three and just um, pull off from there. And then that's the main pattern right there. And then you can then just keep applying that same thing going down the scale. So I'm gonna move down a bit. So that's one way to do the scales with hybrid picking. Um, you could just practice also. Just with um, switching almost as if it's alternate. So pick finger, pick finger, pick finger. And usually when it's going down, I tend to apply more of a sweeping type movement instead of a um, just straight up hybrid picking type of movement. Uh, who would you say most music or improviser guitars? Jesus, um, that's a loaded question. Um, I don't think there's the most musical improviser guitarist, but I could say my favorite because it's most implies that some of them are like better than, than the others. And I think that once you get to a certain levels, um, they're just different. You can't really say one's better than the other. But my favorite right now, I totally have to say it's Andrew Nieri. Um, um, I also like Guthrie Govan a lot. I'm getting into Tim Miller again. I haven't really listened to him for a bit. But yeah, right now my favorite is Andrew Nieri. I love um, his vocabulary. He can play a lot of stuff from rock to prog to jazz to fusion. So I like that a lot. Um, camera's a little bit out of focus um, and I love the vocabulary I love that it's very soulful um, but then at the same time it can be very technical it's very musical as well so he's my favorite right now but that can totally change at any second um, I change a lot any advanced tips for sweep arpeggios love from India okay so Sweeps, the best thing I can show is learn the movements really well, practice them slowly, and figure out exactly the, the specific movement that you're going to do with your left hand and the specific movements that you're going to do with your right hand. So, if we're doing A major, for example. <laughs> Specifically, you need to know specifically what fingers are going to go where, and you're going to need to know the picking pattern, because this type of arpeggio you can do in a lot of different ways. You can go like this, but at the same time, you can pick everything. And that's going to imply, um, that's going to change the amount of notes that you're going to do. If you pick everything, at least for me, I like repeating the lowest note the highest notes of it. What that does is, once you change, then you can, there's going to be no diff type of difference um, in, in the picking pattern if you have to change your arpeggio. arpeggio. So, it's going to be something like that. 
and then once you have the pattern once you have the pattern down it's just a matter of going playing the same thing over and over and over and training the hand to just do it effortlessly it's almost like walking um, up to a certain point because you don't think about each step that you're doing because you've done it so many different times that it's just it's normal you can totally talk you could do a whole bunch of different things while you're walking right it's so the same thing applies to a lot of these very technical type of things just program your hand make sure that you program program it correctly the first time that you do it because if you and then and then specifically be very specific about the fingers the movements that you're doing because if you're doing let's say you're practicing the same pattern but then one day you practice like this and then let me do it slower one day you practice it with the pinky and then another day you practice it with the third finger that's good if you're gonna change up the pattern but if it's the same exact pattern um, make sure to, to apply the same way because one day you're gonna be playing live and as you yeah my, my cat's going out the window um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> lost track of everything with that um, yeah, one day you're gonna be playing live and for that split second you're gonna kind of freak out it's like do I play with my pinky do I play with my middle finger or the third finger or whatever and in that instant that's where you make a mistake because you're not sure of how you're gonna play it so pick one way and do it that same way every time at least for very specific movements not for everything um, but if I want to do this, I'm going to do it the same way every time. But if I want to change it up, that doesn't mean that you, could, you can't change it up for other things. If you want to stream for that, then I'm going to start with my third video. But then when I'm playing, I know specifically if I'm going to this, or if I'm going to this, you get what I'm saying, right? Um, so yeah, just pick a, a way of doing it and do it that same way every time. Donde puedo, wow, se me perdió la, donde puedo escuchar tus canciones. No existen todavía, en mi computadora las puedes escuchar. Pero, yo espero para verano tener toda la preproducción hecha y alguna guitarra ya grabada para entonces ir a, a trabajar con los sonidos y la grabación de las otras cosas. Que pues, me gustaría sacar el EP para verano, pero hablando realísticamente, probablemente no salga para verano, porque hay mucho otro trabajo que hay que, que, hay que hacer con eso. Recomiendo escribir la escala en Staff Paper sin el instrumento para crear esa visualización. Eh, recomiendo que hagas todo lo que necesitas para, para ese tipo de visualización. Puedes verlo. Si, si estamos hablando de visualizarla en, en, en el instrumento, recomiendo hasta, hasta escribir diagramas de escala. Yo recuerdo que hace un tiempo yo tenía que estar moviéndome bastante y pues muchas veces no podía llevarme la guitarra, lo que hacía era tomaba papeles y escribía diagramas de guitarra para practicar escalas nuevas o para solidificar ese conocimiento un poco. Que realmente a todo lo que se te ocurra en cuanto a visualización. Do you have any jam track central any other instructional material other than YouTube? I have two instructions. I wish I, I had some jam track central. Um, That'd be awesome working with those guys. We got a ton of legends on there. So maybe in a couple years, I'll be up to the level. Um, but right now I have two instructional um, videos with the guys from Guitar Tutorials. That's a company up in Italy. And you can find the link to those, I believe in the description box below any of my um, normal YouTube videos. Um, and they're both like lick packages. The cool thing is that I go over each of the different licks. I explain the thought process that went into building each of those licks. So you get bar by bar analysis. You get a whole paragraph of me explaining specifically how each of the lick works. You get um, the chords over where it works. And you get little brackets on top of the notes and the tabs where where it says where the notes came from. So if it's chromatic, if it's melodic minor, if it's whatever, minor pentatonic scale, 
it says it on right there. So there's no guesswork at all happening. Everything's laid down, so that's that's really cool. Um, things specifically, if you're trying to learn new things, um, I would like to do another new one this year, but I have so many different things. I gotta I gotta do the I gotta finish the album, which is priority number one right now. Um, I gotta finish translating the book into Spanish, the one I already have out. I have a second book in the works and and I want to start some some online courses but that's gonna take a long time so um, and that's pretty much the last thing on the list because I want to finish the second book I want to finish the translation of the first book and I gotta get that album out that everyone wants to start playing around but yeah see what happens so your favorite guitar do you like VGA? VGA? Um, yeah for now Sir has definitely been my favorite guitar. I've got, got all these other guitars here. Um, I like them a lot. Um, some of them need a little bit of fixing, so that's why I don't play them a lot. The other ones are really nice. I like this Strat a lot. I like the two Tellies a lot. Also, this Tellies a little broken, so I gotta fix the pickup on it and get it set up. Um, but they're not my main guitars. Is when I pick them up, the things that come out are not exactly what I would normally play with. and that's good and that's not good at the same time like whenever I play this white strap I tend to go more like bluesy um, not country but more in that classic blues type of sound and that's not my main genre so whenever I play this guy I get more of the fusion rockier type of deal I like the Steinberger, the small Steinberger, a lot too. Um, but that makes me want to play too much, like jazz rock fusion. It takes away all the bands out of my playing. So I like a couple bands and a lot, a couple more rock type um, phrasing. So this is the, the guitar for that right now. I don't know why, psychologically, that's the way it works. Um, how are you connecting the arpeggios? Is it on the basis of relative modes? Oh, um, with the hybrid picking thing, I'm connecting them thinking um, thinking about, it depends on the way I'm thinking about it, but specifically, I'm thinking about the notes that work the best over that C chord. So you could do, yeah, you gotta think about it as, adding extensions so and I'm also thinking about it as if it's, if it's comfortable for the hand so if I'm here or if I'm here I mean, a very common like substitution is the minor like the minor arpeggio from the from the third of a major chord well, I guess it's pretty much the same thing as a major nine chord without having to think major nine so I think of those type of things. The other thing I like think about is is it easy and comfortable for my hand? Because if it doesn't come naturally, I'll practice it, but it's gonna take a lot more practice. This the, the actual movement, especially with the with the hyper ping already is a little uncomfortable. Super dirty, I gotta practice it a whole lot more. <clears throat> but I don't need the extra effort of it being super complicated. So I tend to lean into things that sort of are sort of simple the first time I can do them. I, I can actually sort of play them the first time I try them. And then I just perfect them. I just, not perfect, you know, but I work on them. I get them better and better each time. Um, so yeah, I tend to look at it as extensions that work and if the actual shapes and movements are comfortable to the hand. So those are the different, two different things I consider when adding those types of things. And what kind of pick is that? That's a, it's a Dunlop Jazz 3, a normal priority Dunlop. You like the video games, huh? You like video game soundtracks and which one? I haven't really done any, I haven't checked out specific um, soundtracks like that, um, but I do like video game soundtracks. Like I'm playing a video game, I notice the music. Um, I tend to like those types of, of sounds 
and songs and tracks and all that stuff. But I I don't really have like specific um, tracks that I can, or soundtracks that I can talk about. I like skipping better. That's good, man. I mean, whatever works for anybody. It's those things. I need to cast a code. To know that friends are from your ass is here. That's this jump. We got to go. I want to follow. Now follow me to Portuguese. Um, <laughs> I'm actually practicing a little bit, but um, I'm not that great at it. So can't really. I can understand it, but I can't can't speak it too much. Show us some outside tricks. Whoa, whoa! I have a ton of comments that I haven't gone through. Okay, let me go quickly. Apparently, I'm talking too much. Mr. Stanis is a senior classical student. I haven't um, tried them, but I told them I'm going to take a screenshot of that. So thank you for that. Now, in terms of outside tricks, oh, Eric, thanks for buying those. Man. Uh, okay. Let me see. Outside tricks. So, my favorite right now is either adding melodic minor or harmonic minor to everything, adding the flat five to everything, everything minor. So that's really cool. It's almost like looking at it as the blue scale. But not treating it as the blues goes. So, for example, that type of thing. That does not sound like the blues scale, but it is. Um, it is the blues scale, except I added the six when I was doing this whole. Just to make it dominant and bluesier. Um, but yeah, add, adding that black flat. So adding the seventh and the flat five to a minor thing is gonna make it sound like dark. <laughs> And just adding different chromatics like that. So there, I'm thinking is I have the minor scale. I already talked about this in the video a little bit, but just going like that. But if you really, really, really want to go out, um, I'm going to talk about a whole tone. Oh, I think I already mentioned it. It's just if you have to a minor chord, you could play whole tone up or below a half. That's the same thing because it's a whole tone scale. Um, over that minor chord. It's gonna sound very odd. The cool thing about full tone is you can get some really cool, um, like not arpeggios, but like string skipping, tapping type of moves, just because it's a symmetrical scale. So something like let's say in C. Um, yeah, let's just do C. Ah, I forgot the name, Bolton. That's what it sounded like. Simpsons. Oh. All those kind of notes that be, would be a lot cleaner if I use this. Let's see if it's true. No, I'm sorry. And those types of things. Let's see what else. What I say? This is okay. Good. I want the. I want to get some pretty shoes. The only one. Wow. Thank you. Les Paul or Stratocaster. I may have to say Stratocaster with a humbucker in the bridge. A little bit of best of both worlds. I really like the Les Paul sound. But I'm more of a strat guy. But I really like the sound of a good Les Paul um, with a, a, a classic 
plus ball sound with like a really good amp I'm like cranked all the way up it sounds really good I'm definitely more of a strat guy okay auto amp um, my amp this guy right here is a just a boss katana um, I would I love other amps but I don't have enough money for them and at this point I think it's not even it's not sort of worth it. I have a fractal here, which I don't use too often, but whenever I go out to play um, my own stuff out there, I'm going to start using the fractal. Um, and just for recording purposes also, this fractal, you pay X amount of money, and you have a ton of amps. I know it's not exactly the same, um, but neither is going running an amp through mic, specifically if you're recording... Uh, in a place that's not suited to record specifically um, amps or guitars or whatever. Like if I record guitar amps from my apartment, it's gonna sound awful. So the axe straight into the into the computer, it's gonna sound a lot better than a poorly mic'd amp in this room. So in terms of recording, I sort of prefer the fractal. But within the fractal, I like using the high watt and the Soldano type amps. Um, I still gotta get into, once I get on with the actual recordings of the, the guitar parts, I'll let you guys know specifically what I like and what I've done. But for us, lead sounds, I really like the Soldano and the High Watt. So, Mr. Tom Gates, have you seen the Roland Gates video? <laughs> shapes? Do you use this concept? Um, I haven't seen that video. I've seen his videos, I've talked to him on Facebook while ago um but I, I can't really i don't i don't know anything about that so i can't really talk on the subject do you know any of his folk songs i don't i haven't really learned a lot of that so yeah i just don't <laughs> not that i don't like them just i haven't learned any other songs off the whole tour less interesting if you know for string changing work I, that's a really good thing I, I like doing that a lot i have about two specific orders that I like a lot. I gotta get into practicing those again. Thanks. Um glad you liked the video and that it helped out. Go to those those videos and all the numbers yeah. Man, I'm glad you like the, the 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 videos and that that it's, it's working. If your guitar but it's not my style because I like to record fits and plug guitars. Yeah I really liked to have those extra frets just because it's a little bit more. I don't enjoy Floyd Rose guitars because I'm not super technical with the actual like, equipment. Not super, like I'm not a real handsy guy with like doing setups and actually working on the stuff. So I used to have an Ibanez or Joe Satriani model and I got rid of it just because of the, I couldn't deal with the Floyd man. Whenever I broke a string or I had to change strings and all you know, that, it was just such a hassle. Um, but yeah, that's that's the only reason I don't enjoy like Floyd's. I love the ability to go up and down with the whammy bar. This one actually floats a little bit, a little bit faster. Just a little tiny bit, but it's not the same as a Floyd. But truthfully speaking, I don't think I really need it um, for my type of playing. But yeah, again, everyone has some things. Four notes for strings. Um. I don't. I haven't really worked those out too much, um, but uh, you could do it with maybe the pentatonic scale and do it with some tapping. That that's only works. Your videos are awesome. Keep them coming. So, will do, man. I will totally keep working on them. The brightness setting on my phone changes whenever I tap the screen to go scroll down in the comments. Still weaving violin. I don't really understand that, um, Raimundo. Um, you mean if they go with the the actual videos? Like, does it help for the videos? It totally helps for some things. I thought Simpsons was the yeah. The Simpsons is the audio mode. It's just I play one. Um, three and sharp four. That's why it sort of sounded like The Simpsons. Schecter is my main. Schecter is really good. I, I've tried a couple ones and I like them a lot. 
Um, have a couple friends that work directly with Schecter, and then apparently it's a really good company. They have like really good um, like art artist relationships. You talk pitch access theory and its uses. Now, now what I've gotten from pitch access is I believe is something mm -hmm. something I have. Um, Joe Satriani explains what I've got, and I have to take a better look at it. So I don't want to talk too much on the subject because um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if, it, if this is the thing. But what I've heard is that he likes to play like a string. And that's his pitch axis. And from there, he switches different notes. So if you want to play later. And then from there you can go to minor. Yeah, that's so dirty. <laughs> that probably the most well you could practice different modes with that and you could totally work on different compositions based on that so just borrowing from here and there kind of think about specifically what I'm talking about kind of think of it more as modal interchange um, but but yeah I have to look at the topic a little bit more um, but what I've seen is the whole Satriani thing where he just plays the bass note and jams throughout the different modes, uses the, the actual um, open string as a because it axes were going from one mode to the other, one sound to the other. Have you tried a helix? I have. I haven't really tried it too much, but I'm guessing it's pretty much the same thing as Fractal and Kemper and all the other cool stuff that's already out there. It's always sound cool, man. So whatever you think is awesome. Thanks, man. Depths on creating seemingly never ending legato runs. Um, um, I, let me get back to that question really quick, Eric. Oh, are you using your katana and USB and a separate mic? Not right now. Not right now. I'm, right now, I'm just playing. I don't know if, if it sounds great there, but right now, I'm just using my, my camera's mic, so it shouldn't sound too great. I mean, if it sounds great, that's awesome. But for my videos, I don't even use the katana. I just use the, the stuff on Logic. Logic Tips on creating seemingly never-ending legato runs. Um, for that, it's pretty much what I mentioned before, where I have about six different moves, um, and I keep going into those. But then another thing I really like with legato stuff is mixing it with some arpeggios. So I think they're all D minor. Ah. Every now and then I do a like a small little arpeggio that takes me to a higher note and then I just go down back using the legato. So really just have very specific moves that you have down and then mix and match between all those different moves. Thanks, thanks a lot for the for the videos, man. And yeah, I'm totally doing this from my phone. Like nothing fancy going on here. It's just my phone and a tripod and just playing directly in the app. Let me show you the app. That's it, that's the whole setup. <laughs> I'm not even using my my camera because I don't have I haven't figured out like a way to, to secure everything. I have a, a light which might help, I guess. But yeah, everything's like super low budget um 
super horrible production values. <laughs> I wish I could use my camera for these types of things. Um, but I gotta learn how to do it, and I gotta buy a couple more cables, because I know I gotta use the out of this, and then if I could use the audio from my computer, that'd be awesome as well. I'd probably use a mic. And <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Eric. Remember, <laughs> like this unit went off. Um, thanks, I guess. <laughs> What's your favorite product that you have reviewed? Whoa. Okay, let me think uh -huh. about it. Um. Okay, so right now I've reviewed. Let me think about first what I reviewed. I did the Ref Pad. I did the Ref G4. The Ref G2. I did the Doctor Scientist. I'm gonna do the rat soon. Um, I did the ground control stuff. I think my favorite of them all, like stuff I would talk. Oh, it's different because if, if, yeah, let me think about it. That's the ones that I like the sound the most, and that I would probably like to get for myself. Um, one of them would probably be the Ref G4, just because it sounds like a really cranked amp, and it sounds really, really good. I really, really like that pedal, um, but that one was borrowed, so I didn't get to keep it. I didn't get to um, play around with it too much. And then the other ones that I really liked, and I really liked them all. Let me see. Another one I really liked was the Ground Control Locust Drive, and that one was definitely different. Um, it, it's a drive, but it sounds a little bit like a fuzz. I didn't get to keep that one either. Um, but that one's a really small company. They re do really good stuff. And the, like the, the service, the actual client service or whatever, customer service, that's what I mean. That's really, really good. Um, same with Rev. I mean, I, the G2, they sent it over. The G2 was directly from them, wasn't borrowed from a friend. G4. Um, the G2, they sent it over, and I mean, they sent me an email, and that same day that they said they were sending the G2, the, I got a notification from the mail that it got here, like that same day, which is ridiculous. That never happens, specifically in Puerto Rico. I know that happens in the States with Amazon, where you can order something and get it the same day or the next day. That never happens here. You have to wait at least a week for anything, even if it's like two days shipping, you have to wait a, a week. Um, I don't know how the hell they did it, but I got that pedal. Maybe they shipped it before, I don't know. Um, but I got it like that, like super, super fast. And um, yeah, I got, I got, <laughs> changed the subject real quick. Um, so yeah, I like a lot the, the Rev G4, the Locust um, Distortion by um, ground control. Um, the rep pad was really cool specifically because it's really cool because it's very different. It's very, um, you do a lot with it so you get a lot of tones. And the other thing is that well, when I went to NAM um, on January, it was really good and real easy to just plug it in and play and have your sounds there already. It's a smaller type of pedal, so it's not like lugging around my my Axe 8, which is kind of big. Um, it was really small and fit in my my guitar bag, and it had everything. It had everything like delays, reverbs, cleans, like clean sound, chorus, bass, or whatever. Um, and the other cool thing is that I could just switch it from my guitar. So I never really. I didn't get to experiment with that a lot. I, I experimented with more of the effects that you can play around with the pad that you put on the guitar, which is, oh, I think it's in the box. Um, just that pad that goes on the guitar. But when I went to NAMM, I actually saw how practical it can be for playing live. Because I did a demo just accompanying a friend um, on his um, presentation. And Switching from clean to distortion was so cool. I didn't have to step on anything. I just went like this. So that's where I really learned how useful it can be. I um, haven't used it to play live because it's a borrowed product. 
and I don't like taking things that aren't mine out of the house. Um, if you lend it to me, if you, if the company actually sends it over, and for me to keep, then I'll actually use it a little bit more and play around with it. But but stuff that's borrowed, I'm, I'm really careful with it. I don't like getting it out of the house. I keep it in the box all the time. I'm wrapped, especially now that I have a cat. <laughs> Um, so I'm super careful with it. Um, so yeah, I think that's, I went through most of the stuff. Oh, and the Dr. Scientist, um, I don't, it has a, such a huge amount, it's called the Big Quest. It has such a huge amount of different sounds that you can get from it. Um, and it has some really cool features. I liked the infinite reverb and I like the different settings that you get, you could get from the ring modulator. and the fact that you have like a mix knob that stayed true to the mix. You, you literally got um, a clean signal and a, a, a wet signal, like played. You could listen to both of the signals at the same time. Unlike with most mix um, knobs, they actually sounds just like one um, signal, just with more of the effect or whatever. This one literally sounded like like I could have a ton of distortion, but at the same time you heard the the slap from the clean sound of the guitar. That was really cool. Okay, let's go back to the questions. If you could say who your absolute biggest guitar influence of all time at the moment, who would it be? Absolute biggest guitar influence of all time. I always go to the same guy, even though I haven't studied his stuff in a long time. Um, it's Alex Machacek just because I took lessons with him and he sort of changed the whole way that I think about things. Um, gave me a more methodical and scientific approach to learning things instead of just learning things by ear. Um, he showed me how to take a concept and sp split it up and learn, played it in a thousand different ways just so I could get the most out of that same um, piece of information. So most influential, definitely him, because I process the information differently now after having learned from him. Um, playing wise, playing wise, I I wouldn't be able to to say like who I've stolen the most. <laughs> uh, but I I went through. The thing is, I I tend to go like. I tend to start studying different guys, right? So I went through a huge Richie Gotson phase, a huge Holtworth phase, a huge, um, a semi-huge Tom Quell phase, not a long time. And now, my camera went out of focus again. And now I'm sort of in an Andrew Neary phase, even though I can't really play a lot of the stuff he does, so. Um, it's not super like influential. I would really love to add those like finger picked parts arpeggios, but yeah, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> hey man, how do I go from playing V Love to Fusion? Add a distortion pedal. <laughs> um not really much. You could totally just grab a distortion pedal, like learn to control a distortion pedal, add a couple bends, like a couple of rock legs, and you're pretty much set. Man, my camera keeps losing focus. I don't know why. Okay, so I've already been here for an hour and 40 minutes, so this is probably the last um, question I'm going to take because I'm already a little bit tired and i still got a long day ahead of me. The modes are built off the major scale. What's the best way to make the modes sound different or like a mode? Okay. So the best way to make the mode sound like a mode. Um, let me see how I can explain this because I don't know where the um, how you look at the mode is a, like a super concrete answer. Um, but if you're looking at the patterns, just like this is me, this is the way, then it's all going to sound like the major scale, at least at least for me. What really determines the sound of a mode is the stuff that's going behind it or how you are applying it over a chord. 
but for example, if you have this chord right here, which in this case will be A flat major seven sharp eleven with G in the bass, that, that already sounds rigid. So you just play rigid over it. That's pretty much it. If you have a major chord. So that right there, again, already sounds like Lydian. I'm not doing anything special to make it sound like Lydian. It's just I'm playing, I'm playing Lydian chords behind it. And I'm resolving all the phrases to... Not resolving all the phrases to the, to the, to the tonic or the root. Um, I can resolve to the third or the seventh. But I can totally resolve to the chord tones. So that, that totally helps a lot. So that's pretty much it. Really what makes it sound more like a mode is the chords are happening behind that. So for that, I have a lesson called modal triads or modal chords. Um, Rick B. has a really good lesson, a couple really good lessons um, that works on that, so definitely check him out also. Um, and that's it. It's just what makes the mode sound like the mode and giving emphasis on those notes. A lot of the times those are voids, so you gotta be careful with that. Um, but, but yeah, like for instance, if you, you have Dorian, the natural six is what's gonna make it Dorian. So. Now, the natural six is also an avoid. So it's a tone that you wanna play a lot, but not stay on it too long. So you don't wanna go. Unless you have that chord happening in the background. It's this. Why? Because you're gonna get the same thing that we did before. It's gonna sound like this. And even though that sounds cool for certain things, it's gonna, it's gonna not distort, it's gonna create some tension that you don't really want. It's not that nice, cool tension. Um, it's, it's just gonna clash a little bit with it. So, yeah, emphasis on the, the sounds. The, the notes that sound like the mode, and emphasis on the solving to the chord tones behind it. And, of course, playing the actual chords that sound like the mode. All right, let me see the last messages. Thank you for this. Of course, man. Um, I'm glad that I did this. I haven't done it in a while. I think I might just start doing them on, on Patreon um, at least once a month. I had that in the YouTube experience feature at the beginning, but I don't know if I actually took it out, um, but it started getting hard at the beginning, so I ended up getting it out of there, but I hope to start doing it more. And now we're I'm pretty much quarantined in my room. Um, hopefully I'll do one just through here a couple more times. And I just want to add, can I your chance you have so little? And so I guess I really have special for you so I guess you can like Um thanks a ton man. I mean there's there's room for, for everybody. Um I'll just keep working and, and see how how I get things done or whatever. I don't know. Um but yeah of course thanks a ton for the continued support. Um yeah, if anyone else have any type of questions right now and just shoot the last one if not then i'm just gonna head out because i have a ton of phone calls i gotta do now um and some work that i gotta turn in for my work because i'm doing everything from home now the whole quarantine and whatnot um okay so no new questions so i'm just gonna head out all right thanks for joining me you guys um it was a really fun afternoon i have to do this more often all right thanks for watching